Um, Over the last few weeks, we've been reading through the book of Habakkuk, and today we have reached the second chapter. So if you've got your pew Bibles, um, you can turn to page 941 and Habakkuk chapter 2. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. So that's 941 in the pew Bibles, Habakkuk chapter 2. We're going to read the whole chapter. So let's hear God speaking to us. Habakkuk says, I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. Then the Lord replied, Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. See, he is puffed up. His desires are not upright. But the righteous will live by his faith. Indeed, wine betrays him. He is arrogant and never at rest because he is as greedy as the grave and like death is never satisfied. He gathers to himself all the nations and takes captive all the peoples. Will not all of them taunt him with ridicule and scorn, saying, Woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. How long must this go on? Will not your debtors suddenly arise? Will they not wake up and make you tremble? Then you will become their victim. Because you have plundered many nations, the peoples who are left will plunder you. For you have shed man's blood. You have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. Woe to him who builds his realm by unjust gain, to set his nest on high, to escape the clutches of ruin. You have plotted the ruin of many peoples, shaming your own house and forfeiting your life. The stones of the wall will cry out and the beams of the woodwork will echo it. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by crime. Has not the Lord Almighty determined that the people's labor is only fuel for the fire? that the nations exhaust themselves for nothing. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbours, pouring it from the wineskin till they are drunk so that he can gaze on their naked bodies. You will be filled with shame instead of glory. Now it's your turn. Drink And be exposed. The cup from the Lord's right hand is coming round to you. And disgrace will cover your glory. The violence you have done to Lebanon will overwhelm you. And your destruction of animals will terrify you. For you have shed man's blood. You have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. Of what value is an idol? Since a man has carved it, or an image that teaches lies. For he who makes it trusts in his own creation. He makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to the wood, come to life. Or to the lifeless stone, wake up. Can it give guidance? It's covered with gold and silver. There is no breath in it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Well, before we come and look at Habakkuk uh, chapter 2 a little bit more closely, we have got a second reading this morning from the New Testament. So I wonder if you would turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. 
verse 32, and that's on page 1009 in the Pew Bibles. So that's Hebrews chapter 10, page 1009 in the Pew Bibles. And we're going to begin at verse 32. The Apostle writes, Remember those earlier days, after you'd received the light, when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a very little while, He who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. This is God's word. Let's pray as we turn back to Habakkuk chapter 2. Father, the proverb says, Where words are many, transgression is not lacking. And so, Lord, as I come to speak, as we come to listen, please would your Holy Spirit watch over us and guard us from error. Lord, teach us truth this morning. Take away the lies and help us to believe in your good purposes and in your promise. We pray that all in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you wouldn't mind turning back to Habakkuk chapter 2 on page 941, we'll be going through that passage now. So we're in week three of our series looking at this uh, prophecy of Habakkuk. And it began in all the way back in chapter 1 with this question, how long... O Lord. That was Habakkuk's prayer as he saw the sin of his people. How long, Lord, will you allow your people to turn away from you towards pursuing their own comfort and their own interests? And the Lord's answer was devastating. Not long, Habakkuk. I am going to send the Babylonians to destroy the kingdom and take away your people into captivity. Habakkuk's first prayer was answered, but not in the way that he expected. And so last week, we saw a second prayer of Habakkuk, a second complaint. How, Lord, can you punish the sin of your people by sending an even more wicked people to punish us? How can destroying your kingdom advance your purposes? And so we left Habakkuk asking these questions uh, last week uh, with verse 1 of our reading this morning. We left him in verse 1 of chapter 2. I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what God will say to me and what answer I am am to give to this complaint. We left Habakkuk with a lot of questions last week. And those questions have still not gone away. We maybe have more answers now as we can read Habakkuk in light of the cross and God's victory over evil there. But we still see injustice and evil flourishing in our world. And to all intents and purposes, it seems like God doesn't care about it, doesn't it? Just to take a local example, when is justice going to come for those boys who seem to have been so maltreated in that house just around the corner in Kinkora? Where's the justice for them, Lord? Why has so much of the Western world turned away from you, Lord, after so many years of history of being at the center of your purposes? How is that going to advance your purposes, Lord? How is it going to make it easy for us to believe you when so much of our society has turned away from you? 
And what about me, Lord? What about my hopes? What about my dreams? I know that you can intervene. And I know that you care. So, Lord, why don't you? And why, oh why, did Ireland have to win a Grand Slam at Twickenham (laughs) on St. Patrick's Day? But they are serious questions, aren't they, apart from that last one. (laughs) And so today, we're going to look at how God answers these questions. And the answer begins uh, in verses 2 and 3, and it's the basis for everything else. Then the Lord replied, Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets, so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. Habakkuk is almost literally meant to make a placard. He's meant to write the vision of the future on tablets so that he can display it to everyone. There's going to be one simple message that's going to cut through all the chaos that's surrounding Habakkuk. And this is the message. This is the revelation. The kingdom of God is coming. That's the message of all the prophets. It's the message of Habakkuk. It's the message of the New Testament, and it's what we're waiting for. There is one vision of the future. Habakkuk says the kingdom of God is coming. And why is that true? How do we know that? Ultimately, because God says so. He says the immediate future is bleak. The Babylonians are going to come and they are going to take away the people with fish hooks. The kingdom is going to be destroyed. But you're not on a road to nowhere. I myself have committed to this. I have got the date in the diary. There is an appointed time to tell everyone, wait for it. I wonder, do you ever get the the feeling, the sense that history sort of repeats itself, that each generation or two, we actually forget the lessons that have been learned, and we just repeat the same cycles of stupidity and violence. And I think that's right in a sense. History does repeat itself uh, as we keep making the same old mistakes. But it's not going around in circles. This world has got a destiny. There is an appointed time. There's going to be an end. There is going to be a day when God is all in all. And that is going to be true no matter how bad things look to us just now. You probably know how eventually the mighty city of Rome fell to the barbarians. But I wonder, did you know that people at the time, many people, actually blamed that on the Christians? Because the empire had turned away from the traditional gods to worship Christ. And people thought this was a kind of a judgment by the pagan gods. And um, Augustine was around at that time, and he wrote a famous book called The City of God, kind of justifying uh, why uh, the Christian religion was true, even though everything seemed to be going wrong in the Roman Empire. And he said, uh, ignorant people often think that their own times are exceptional. When you don't have a sense of history, it's quite easy to think, goodness, the world is ending. But Augustine said that 1,500 years ago when Rome fell. And since then, many kingdoms have risen and fallen. The world hasn't ended yet. And in fact, there is one kingdom that hasn't fallen. The kingdom of God is still spreading through this world like yeast through the dough. People are still coming to know the Lord. After 2,000 years, it maybe seems now that in the our part of this world, it seems like the kingdom of heaven is maybe going downhill again. But let's take a bit of a bigger perspective. Habakkuk was holding up his sign many, many years ago. He was holding it up in Augustine's day, and he's still holding it up today. The kingdom of God is coming. There is just one vision of the future. And I think Habakkuk would say, placard this upon your hearts, my friends. Whatever the chaos in our world, in our nation, in our own lives, 
However much our personal relationships seem broken and our fears for the future seem to be distant, no matter what the injustices we see around us, make sure you realise that none of this is going to change God's purposes. There is only one vision of the future that this world is racing towards. One meeting with the Lord Jesus Christ who's going to come in the glory of his Father with all the holy angels. There's going to be one ending, one resolution and one wonderful new beginning. The kingdom of God is coming. Nearer and nearer draws the time, the time that will surely be, when the earth will be full of the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. So Habakkuk is holding up this placard to us this morning. And through him, the Lord is asking us a question now. How are you going to respond? How are you going to live in light of this vision? This one vision of the future means that there are now two ways to live. Are we going to live in light of this future? Or are we going to try to ignore it? Have a look at verses 4 and 5. See, he is puffed up. His desires are not upright. But the righteous will live by his faith. Indeed, wine betrays him. He is arrogant and never at rest, because he is as greedy as the grave, and like death is never satisfied. He gathers to himself all the nations and takes captives, captive all the peoples. Now, these couple of verses are a little bit confusing until you notice um, that there's a big contrast going on. Uh, The puffed-up person person in verse 4 is, I think, the same as the arrogant person in verse 5. They're a sort of narcissistic, self-promoting person. And then in the middle, there's another person, the righteous, who lives by his faith. So what does that mean, to live by faith? Well, Habakkuk has just been told that there's one vision of the future, Um, and wait for it. And now the Lord says, well, the righteous are those who live by faith, who put their hope in that vision of the future. The righteous are people who wait. Faith means waiting. So that's one of the two ways to live. The other way is in this puffed up, self-inflated way. At verse 5, we can see it means never being at rest, being as greedy as the grave, like death, being never satisfied, gathering to yourself all the nations and taking captive all the peoples. There's this picture, isn't there, of kind of insatiable desire, gobbling up whatever you want to feed your desires. Now, I think the king of Babylon is particularly in the spotlight here. He's the person who's taking captive all the peoples. We saw that last week. But it's really important for us to see that he represents a much bigger reality. This contrast isn't really about Babylonians and non-Babylonians. It's about the righteous and the unrighteous. There are just two ways to live. And it's all based on whether you're going to live in line with this vision of the future. Are you going to be somebody who seeks to fulfill your own desires now at the expense of other people, sort of gobbling them up? Or are you going to be somebody who waits for the coming kingdom, for the day when God fulfills all our desires and gives us all that we could possibly imagine? And I want us to be very clear this morning that there are no other options than this. You cannot hedge your bets. You cannot have your cake and eat it. Are you going to live by faith or by works? Are you going to wait for the Lord's future or are you going to try to fulfill your desires now by your own efforts? There are just two ways to live. We hate this, don't we? Seems very black and white. Uh, Some of you know I'm involved in a ministry called Gospel in the City that uh, has a kind of a weekly uh, lunchtime talk uh, going through the Bible. Uh, in, a, in a coffee shop in the city centre of Belfast for kind of workers to come along to. And we actually had a complaint. Somebody went to the head office of the chain that we meet in 
uh, to say that they'd heard what we were talking about, and it, it was too black and white. That was the issue. It was too black and white. We love to find alternative solutions, don't we? And maybe you think you found one this morning. Maybe you're here, but you're also elsewhere, spiritually speaking. I have to say, I meet a lot of people in this city who, who, who definitely have faith in some, has, it's got some role in their lives. But its priority, its importance can sort of seem to fluctuate depending on where they're at in their lives. Uh, sometimes the kids' education or happiness will be prior, top priority. Sometimes their own personal ambitions. Sometimes just an, a lifestyle that's non-negotiable. But Habakkuk says you cannot do that. You're either a person of faith whose whole life is shaped by waiting uh, or you're somebody who's puffed up and you're living for yourself. Now, of course, everyone's got natural desires. Um, it's, it's understandable for us to want things for ourselves. But if you're a person of faith, then you've really placed your personal desires on the back burner. You're content to wait. And when we do find ourselves seeking to fulfill our desires at the expense of other people, the person of faith repents. Well, I recognize that this is hard for us to hear. It's hard because of the society we live in. We teach our children to be competitive, to look after number one. And maybe you were brought up that way. It's a hard habit to shake. And these days, many in our society are saying that you cannot question another person's desires. Whatever they want is what's going to make them happy, and they should go for it. And Habakkuk's saying something very different to that, isn't he? It's also hard for us because of our sin. It's our misplaced desires, right, that give birth to sin. That's what James tells us. It's our misplaced desires that put us at the center of the universe. And it's our misplaced desires that seek what God has not yet given us. And it's also hard for us because actually our desires are God-given. We are wired for more beauty and more joy and more life than all this world can offer. And those desires are not wrong. Just have a look across the page to verse 14. This is a very famous verse. The Lord promises that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. God's glory, it's his beauty, it's his stupendously rich life, it's the unhindered joy of sheer existence. And one day this earth will be absolutely saturated in that glory. That's what the Lord wants for us. He's made us to enjoy that glory forever. It's okay to have an insatiable desire for this. All our misplaced desires are really taking our eyes off the desire for God and putting them onto things that will never fulfill them. But God has made us for his overflowing glory and so it is hard for us to wait in this world. But as people of faith in a fallen world, we need to keep our desires in check. The kingdom of God is coming. Don't be restless. Wait. Well, if we're honest, we probably need just a little bit more encouragement than Habakkuk has given us so far. And so in the rest of the chapter, Habakkuk is going to really help us to see that we should be living for God's coming kingdom. We've had one vision of the future, two ways to live, and now we're going to get five woes to encourage us to make the right choice. Let's have a look at verse 6. Will not all of them taunt him with ridicule and scorn? That's how we need to read the rest of this chapter. It's a taunt song. It's a ridicule song. It's mockery of the person who lives for his own pleasure, uh, especially as it's represented by the king of Babylon. And so this song is a, is a song of warning and hope for people who live by faith. Uh, the warning is, 
don't go their way. Don't be like the king of Babylon. And the hope is because their way is going to come to a bitter end. And here's the chorus. DIY glory only brings death. So let's look at them quickly one by one. Hear the Lord speaking through Habakkuk as he sings. Verse six, uh, uh, as he sings, woe to the money grabber. Rest of verse 6. Woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. How long must this go on? Well, not long. Eventually, the people you've stolen from will demand their money back. What goes around comes around. You will have to pay your debts because you have shed people's blood. DIY glory only brings death. Woe, secondly, to the unethical developer. Verse 9. Woe to him who builds his realm by unjust gain, to set his nest on high, to escape the clutches of ruin. You're trying to climb up so high to almost escape from this world, and you're doing it at the expense of this world. But this world will never let you get away from it. Verse 11, the stones of the wall will cry out, and the beams of the woodwork will echo it. DIY glory only brings death. Woe to the empire builder. Verse 12, woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by crime. Has not the Lord Almighty determined that the people's labor is only fuel for the fire, that nations exhaust themselves for nothing? Woe to you if you seek glory in your own achievements at the expense of other people. The best you're going to do by crushing other people is build a bonfire for somebody else to light. DIY glory only brings death. Instead, live for what lasts. Live for that vast ocean of God's unfathomable, limitless glory. Number four, woe to the date raper. Verse 15, woe to him who gives drink to his neighbours, pouring it from the wineskin until they're drunk, so that he can gaze on their naked bodies. You will be filled with shame instead of glory. If you're somebody who enjoys seducing people uh, and laughing at their weaknesses, woe to you. God will expose your wickedness. DIY glory only brings death. Number five, lastly. Woe to the idol maker, over the page, verse 19. Woe to him who says to the wood, come to life, or to the lifeless stone, wake up. Can it give guidance? It is covered with gold and silver. There is no breath in it. Now this last one's maybe a little bit different, because we can probably see some of the relevance of these other ones, talking about uh, our greed. And we can all, I think, have a sense that, yes, we can be greedy and putting our desires ahead of other people. But we probably don't think that we spend our weekends in the tool shed kind of crafting idols to worship. So let's have a a little look a bit more closely at this one. I think the key is that the person who's making idols is doing a lot of talking. He says to the wood, come to life. And contrast that with verse 20. But the Lord is in his holy temple. He lives, and let all the earth be silent before him. When we do all the talking, we're going to end up with a God of our devising, a God we've made up. A comfortable God, maybe, who who happens to kind of look a lot like us, who doesn't mind our plans for our glory. But the Lord is enthroned in the holiness of heaven, And do you think he thinks that's a good idea? DIY glory only brings death. So do you want to worship the Lord truly? Do you? Then shh!
Well, it may seem like Habakkuk is offering us a strange kind of religion, a religion of silence, a religion of inactivity, a religion of discipline, a religion of deferred pleasure. All this waiting sounds pretty deadly, doesn't it? But this is exactly the message that Habakkuk wants to get under our skin. He wants to challenge our assumptions. Often, the people who look most alive in this world are the people who are living to fulfill their own desires. They enjoy the parties, they acquire the wealth, they build the houses, and they celebrate their own achievements. But DIY glory only brings death. And often it's those who look most like death in this world who Habakkuk says are actually heading for life. So don't believe the lie that life is all about working to get what you want. Believe the truth. The righteous will live by his faith. Christ has come and he is coming again. Wait for him. Some of you this morning really need to hear this. And so I'm going to plead with you. Don't live for your desires. Don't make us pay for it. If you do, you'll have nature, humanity, and God himself all against you. However much money you make, it will have to be repaid. However high you build your house, it will fall down. No matter how much how much you are laughing now, you will be mortified in eternity. No matter much, no matter much how much you enjoy coming to church now, one day the living Lord will ask you for an account of your life. So take this moment, take it now. Deflate your pride. Put, take the focus off yourself and decide that you're going to give up working to fulfill your own pleasures. Decide you're going to reshape your whole life around God's coming glory. So one vision, two ways to live, and five woes to encourage us to live by faith. We read from the book of Hebrews a few moments ago, and in it the apostle is writing to Christians who were once as keen as mustard, They willingly accepted all kinds of costs, even people taking their possessions, because they were sure that they had a truer and more lasting possession. But now the apostle recognises that they're in danger of trying to have their cake and eat it. They're planning for their retirement, they're investing in their careers, they've become risk-adverse, and their worship has become comfortable, rather than being shaped by God's word. And so the apostle urges them. He pleads with them. And I'm going to close with this. He says, do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. Nearer and nearer draws the time the time that will surely be when the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. Let's be quiet for a moment. Our Father in heaven, we have listened this morning. We've been quiet as you've spoken to us. And now we want to say to you that we do want to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, knowing that all these things will be added to us. But Lord, we acknowledge that we are tempted to live a different way. And so, Father, please forgive us when we've tried to fulfill our desires at the expense of others' good. Forgive us when we've reshaped you into a God who would approve of that, a kind of heavenly sugar daddy. Forgive us, Lord, we pray. 
Father, thank you for your wonderful promises that you've made to us. Thank you for the hope of your glory filling the earth. Help us, Father, to stop being puffed up. Help us to humble ourselves before you, trusting that you will one day give us far more than we could possibly ask or even imagine. Father, help us to be people of faith. Please grow our trust in your power, in your goodness, and in your unwavering faithfulness. Help us to recognize that our comforts are provisional. Please take them away if they are damaging our faith. Lord, this is a weighty prayer, but we pray that it would be our great prayer. That we would be people whose lives are focused on waiting for your coming kingdom. That we might speed the day of your coming. And that this world might become the home of righteousness. And that we might dwell in your presence forever. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. For my righteous one will live by faith. Gracious God, we thank you for the reminder that he who is coming will come and will not delay. But meanwhile, those who trust in Christ, the altogether righteous one, are called to live by faith and not by sight. To hold on to those things that are right, even if that means unrequited desires, and living for those things that last. We pray this morning for people experiencing particular trials at this moment in their lives, in their emotions. We pray for carers, for families of people who have recently died and now must pick up the pieces, people going through anxiety or treatment and pray that in their specific circumstances they may not throw away their confidence in the Lord Jesus. We pray for people experiencing difficulties at school and work, those experiencing bullying or unreasonable demands, those under pressure from difficult bosses or their volume of work, and ask that in your mercy you may grant them perspective, calmness of spirit, the ability to entrust their circumstances to the one who sees all things and knows all things. We pray for people who work in school environments under emotional or financial pressure, school heads, teachers, governors, And ask that those who trust in you may go about their work with equilibrium, with a focus and concern for fellow staff and pupils' emotional, spiritual and educational welfare. This weekend, we pray for John and Elizabeth and Andrea ministering in Moldova. We thank you for their safe arrival and participation already this morning in Golgotha service. As they continue their visit, their therapy lessons to Dorcas, to the social workers, to the prison, to the Bible college, will you not only bless them but also make them a blessing? May many righteous live by faith in Moldova and here so that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. 
Grant us such faith, we pray, in the name of the faithful one. Amen.